Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear respected brothers, sisters and viewers. Eid Mubarak. Many of you will be at home celebrating amongst your friends and families. Some of you may have gone to your local mosques or centres. Some of you might even be just watching a lecture, for example, on the event of Qadir. We are once again joined by our esteemed guest, Dr. Said Amman Akshwani, for another episode of Live in London, which will be discussing the topic, as I'm sure many of you would have guessed by now, the topic of Qadir. Sayyidina, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Eid Mubarak. Eid Mubarak to you, the Thank greatest you Eid much. for us to celebrate, and it's an honor to be here. Of course. Uh, Eid al-Qadir is an event where, I guess the Shia revere it as the announcement given to the Ummah of the successorship of Imam Ali alayhi salam once the Prophet dies. Why is it so many people don't know about this great event? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, congratulations to all the viewers out there on this wonderful occasion. Uh, the greatest Eid in the religion of Islam, no doubt, being Eid al-Ghadir. It's inter interesting that you pose this question. Why is it that we can come here and celebrate? And there are 300 million of us who are celebrating this, which is not a small number. But when you're looking in the Islamic world, people will ask the question that there are many out there who may not be celebrating Eid al-Ghadir or may not even know anything about a place called Ghadir Khum or any announcement in relation to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. And I, I find that there are uh, um, a couple of reasons that could be looked at. First and foremost, we are a community that does not read. Let's be very frank about this. Be you Shia, be you Sunni, be you of any school in the religion of Islam today. We are a community that originated as a community of Iqra and today is a community of La Naqra. We were originally a community of readers, but today we're a community and have been for a long time of people who don't read. There are people out there who simply believe in one narrative of how Islamic history developed and how Islamic history originated. And many of them are not taught whatsoever anything else and you find that these people hardly ever will go out to read as in they're content with just praying and fasting they come in the holy month of Ramadan will turn up to the mosque and you'll find that some of them for example in Muharram will come and show their respect to Imam Hussein salam. but there are many out there who will not read about exactly the details of what took place in the life of the holy prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his family there are many Muslims out there who probably have not picked up a book on Islamic history either this year or last year or in some cases the whole of their lives. In some cases some don't know what to read. So there isn't that guidance of what to read as well. But generally we're a community that doesn't do much reading and we're a community that's more content with an external image of what religious is. Secondly, I think that there are people out there who haven't been taught what happened on the day of Ghadir and purposely have been victims of it being hidden from them. I remember recently Raghi Omar had done a documentary on the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, and he talks about the final sermon of the Prophet and the last days of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. And he brings about exactly the same narrative that everybody else does, that there's a final sermon that's de delivered at Hajj. And that's it. This is the final sermon. People get emotional about this sermon. And you look on YouTube or you look on Facebook, you see all the comments. There's only one or two people who say, but don't you know what took place at Ghadir Khum? There are Imams out there who know what took place at Ghadir Khum. And even if they have a different interpretation of what took place, they find it difficult to even discuss that there is a recognition of the position of Ali at an oasis by the name of Khum. But they don't want to discuss it any further. So you find that there are people out there who know about Ghadir, but have purposely hidden it from their communities. That same community has often wondered, is it conceivable that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, would leave this world without making it clear who his successor was? The man who wouldn't leave his house without making clear who his successor was. The man who wouldn't leave Mecca or Medina. If he went to battles like Hunayn or Tabuk without making sure that people knew who the successor was, is it conceivable 
that he would leave the whole religion without them knowing who the leader was. He's the final prophet of God and his final messenger and his greatest messenger. But who's the one who will lead the affairs of the ummah? But these imams of the mosques, many of them have hidden not even what we believe took place, but hidden the general narrative of an incident that is one of the most authentic incidents in Islamic history. Now, people may differ as to what the conclusion is of that incident, but there's no doubt when it comes to Tawatur, when it comes to this unbelievable number of narrations that surrounds it, when it comes to authenticity, you will not come to an incident like the incident of Ghadir. Allam al amini may Allah bless his soul in his phenomenal work known as Al Ghadir, a 20 odd volume work, which I recommend to every reader out there. If you want to see, Ghadir mentioned in all of the sources of all the schools of Islam and what took place and every generation that has mentioned what took place at Ghadir. Allam al may Allah rest his soul. In Al Ghadir, the, the voluminous work is called Al Ghadir, makes it clear. So the second category of people are those who sadly have been the victims. I remember of the ayah in the Quran, chapter 2, verse 159. In the that there is a particular la'na. God withdraws his mercy from those who have concealed the truth that has been revealed. And there are people out there who purposely conceal. Then there's the third group of people who will say, yes, Ghadir took place. But it was nothing more than that there was a difference of opinion between Khalid ibn al-Walid and Ali ibn Abi Talib over some of the spoils of Yemen in the period just before. And so the Holy Prophet decides on this really hot day afternoon that I'm going to raise the hands of Ali in front of all of you. Those of you who are going ahead, I'm going to tell you to come back. And those of you who are still on their way, will wait for them. Please everybody get your saddles together. I want to make an announcement. Ali is my friend. And that's all it is. Now when someone sees this, they think to themselves, that, well, that's not a celebration. That's not an Eid. So either we don't read, either the truth has been concealed, or either people have put a narrative on it because of the fact that they in no way whatsoever want there to be a contradiction to occur. What do I mean? If there is a clear announcement about Ali, where the whole Muslim Ummah is to be halted, where those who have gone further on have to be called back, where those who are still to come, we have to wait for them, then what does that say about those who took leadership later on? So that catch-22, that type of difficult situation, some people want to shy away from discussing Ghadir because, okay, if Ali is announced, which rationally you'd expect the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, to make a clear announcement to his ummah, there's no need for your saqifas and your elections later on. You'd expect there to be a clear statement. If then we admit that something did take place, then what does it say about those who assume leadership later on? But one thing is clear, and that is this issue about who exactly is the leader of the Muslims after the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, is so important that in London in 2017, we're still discussing it. It's inconceivable that the man who came to guide mankind would have just left it. Would have just left it, of course. Uh, just a reminder to our viewers uh, you can phone in to wish myself uh, and Eid Mubarak and also uh, <laughs> the doctor, doctor as well um, the number to phone in is 0203 515 one question that I won't purposefully put towards you said is what books would you recommend the people to read given that the Ummah doesn't read much I'll leave that to one of the viewers to call in inshallah, inshallah. Uh, so you mentioned the importance of this Eid why is it so important then to appoint him as an imam? Well, I think the religion is a 23-year-old religion. Therefore, being a 23-year-old religion, it's a religion which is young, a religion made up of people who've converted, some sincerely, some definitely not so sincerely. The Qur'an is a book that has a chapter called The Hypocrites. They are buzzing around Medina. Uh, it's, you know, you can look at other religious books, but to find a chapter called Al-Munafiqun gives you an indication that there are hypocrites everywhere. 
There's Abu Sufyan waiting in the wings and his children. And they've got the help of a few Romans to come and support them as well. There are people who want this religion destroyed. Therefore, you can't certainly leave this religion, 23 years old, just leave it and say, okay guys, you who were a Bedouin 10 years ago, you who've buried your daughter alive, you who've slapped your sister before you came to Islam, you who've killed several people in the battles before you became Muslim, I'm going to trust all of these to be the ones who look after the religion. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, worked tirelessly to ensure that the revelation of the Qur'an was protected. Whoever succeeds him has a major role and that's the protection of the interpretation of the Qur'an from falling into the hands of those people who had bitterness in their heart towards the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. Because for all you know, if the wrong people get into power, then you're going to have people who are going to make sure that certain interpretations of certain verses of the Holy Quran are going to suit their agenda. Like I guess what we have today with ISIS and Daesh and... ISIS and is minuscule compared to some of the hearts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to begin chapter 63 of the Holy Quran by saying that these hypocrites come and say to you, you are the messenger of God. We know that you are the messenger of God. And we tell you that these hypocrites are liars. So... This Eid is fundamental for us to celebrate on the first reason because that guidance given to us that this religion is secure in the hands of Ali, son of Abu Talib. It's a monumental blessing on mankind. Human beings yearn to be like Ali ibn Abi Talib You yearn to be like him. You admire him. Non-Muslims admire him. How many Sikhs and Hindus and Christians have written praise of Ali? Believe you me, I ask you, find me non-Muslims who have written praise of other companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. The odd line or two and people are proud of, George Jordak wrote a whole book called The Voice of Human Justice and he's a Lebanese Christian. Ali ibn Abi Talib is that human being people yearn to become. A philosopher, stroke soldier, stroke warrior, Stroke man of literature, stroke father, stroke husband, stroke leader at war. What else do you yearn to become? When people say to me, what do you say at the beginning of your lectures? What's that line? I say, Alhamdulillah, alladhi ja'alana min al-mutamassikina bi wilayat Sayyidi wa Mawlai Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. They say to me, what does that mean? I say, all praise is due to Allah who allowed us to be of those who held on to the guardianship of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. I don't hold on to Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam because Ali is the son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad. I couldn't care less if he's the son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad. That's not why I revere Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. The Prophet Muhammad had son-in-laws. This way, father-in-laws. This way, this way, this way. That, that, that's not what's important to me. Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, when I look at him, I find the most immaculate human being. A person who every human being looks at as an exemplary figure. And the human being has a yearning for perfection and a yearning for the perfect. Otherwise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't appoint messengers. He'd let us be the ones who choose our leaders. Allah chooses Adam as his caliph. Allah chose Noah. Allah chose Abraham. Allah chose D David. Allah chose Sulaiman. Allah chose Ibrahim. Allah chose Ismail, Musa, Ishaq and so on. Isa. God chooses them. Why? Because he knows. If I leave it in the hands of these guys, they're going to pick who they want. Who's going to suit my business interests? Who's going to give me a big position? Who's related to my tribe? Who, who, who? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses someone, that choice is a day of Eid for me. The announcement from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa on that day of Ghadir, that's a day of Eid for me. But secondly and importantly, you notice the Imams of Ahlul Bayt salam, say, pray as much as you want. Fast as many days as you want without recognizing the wilaya of Imam Ali salam, all of it is null and void. Now what does that mean? I can't deny there are people out there who pray and fast who are wonderful human beings in our religion. But are they praying and fasting according to the guidance of those who the Prophet peace be upon his family said, I leave behind for you, namely the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt salam? Or are they praying and fasting according to the guidance of the odd Iraqi or the odd Palestinian or the odd Egyptian scholar who come randomly 150 years after the Prophet Muhammad dies. 
who are you taking your guidance about prayer and fasting from? Do I take my guidance from the very man who smelt the smell of revelation when it first dawned on the Prophet? Peace be upon his family. Or do I take my guidance from someone who tells me if a black dog walks past you in salah, your salah is batal. <laughs> I have to ask myself this question sincerely. So Imam Sanaq mentions pray prayers the size of Mount Uhud. Without the wilaya of Imam Ali there's no point. Not because I have some attachment to Imam Ali because of the odd war, the odd battle. It's because I find that the very teachings of the Quran are embodied in that one man. And wallah, it's a day of Eid. Because until today, if you ask Muslims in the world, what's the one issue that separates Sunni and Shia? What's the one issue? It's related to Ali. Is Ali ibn Abi Talib the rightful success of the Prophet as number one or number four? It's the same. It's an issue until now, 1,400 years later, still being discussed. It shows you just how important this issue was. And you think that I'm going to go to my grave believing that my Prophet leaves guidance, political and spiritual, in the hands of guys who 10, 12 years ago, one was a drunkard and the other had slapped his sister and the other one had come from gambling habits and the other one had killed at Badr and Uhud. I'm not gonna, that's, I will never accept that. So it's a day of celebration for a number of reasons. And one of the most important is that the blessing of having Ali ibn Abi Talib salam as my spiritual and my political leader. Because you know, some people came and said that Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Imams are our spiritual guides, but others are our political guides. But what does that say about those political guides? If you've chosen others for spirituality, what does that say about the spirituality of the ones you've chosen politically? In Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, you have perfection in spirituality and political guidance. As you mentioned on the Imam show as well, he's the only man in history. One thing that I've, amongst the many things that I've learned from you is he's the only man within Islamic history to say, ask me before you lose me. Yes. Whereas the other four, I don't know. And, <laughs> and you know, there, there's no, <laughs> there's no one um, since the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, who has that line, ask me before you lose me. So it's a, it's, a, it's a day of blessing when I know that that man's my leader. Because the person who leads your religion, leads your group of people, leads a business, you need to make sure that that person has the answers to everything. Yeah, I don't want to go to someone who says, if it wasn't for Ali, I'd be perished. If it wasn't for my two years with Ja'far al-Sadiq, I'd be perished. Let there not be a day where Abel Hassan is not next to me to help me. I want to go to the purest source that was raised by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. So you mentioned a couple of points back that the Prophet waited for the people to reach up to him and he called the ones at the front to come back, which makes me wonder what actually took place at Qadir al-Khum. You know, what, what was the event that took place? Is it even mentioned in the books of, for example, Ahl sunnah Because you mentioned it's mentioned in Qadir. Well, the word Khum you can find clearly mentioned in Sahih Muslim. Very clear mention of Sahih Muslim. There's a famous narration that the Prophet stops at Khum. And if you want, you can Google. Or in the Sahih Muslim search engine online, type the word Khum, K-H-U-M-M. -M. That's the name of the area. Of course, Ghadir is that oasis. Now, until today, people say the Prophet's final ser sermon was in Hajj, was at Hajj. Then what happened at Khum? Why stop at Khum? Who tells you to stop at Khum? He does not speak of his own will, he speaks of revelations from his Lord. I don't know why you would stop at Khum. But one thing I do know is that you wouldn't stop unless your, go your Lord guided you. In Sahih Muslim, that narration is clear. Zayd bin Arqam reflects that when they stopped at Khum, the Prophet made it clear to the people that he's about to return to his Lord. And he tells them, I leave behind for you two weighty things. Hold on to them, you will never go astray. The Quran and my Ahlul Bayt, my Ahlul Bayt, my Ahlul Bayt. Ahlul Bayt. And that some ask the question, are your wives part of your Ahlul Bayt? And he mentions, that the Ahlul Bayt refers to those who cannot accept charity. And then they ask him, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, who are your Ahlul Bayt? And he mentions the sons of Ali. 
عن جعفر عقيل عند عباس. Now there are other books which narrate even further this whole incident. As I mentioned, Alam al Ghadir, Alam al Amin in al Ghadir mentions every reference from every school in Islam which narrates the whole incident. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, is on his way back from Hajj. Now naturally there are some who've gone further ahead from him. And there are others who may still be behind. You know, when you're coming back from Hajj, 100,000 odd of you, you're not all going to be going at the same pace. But there is something that he has to announce which makes him say to his companions, those who've gone ahead of us, go call them. And we'll wait for those who are coming behind us. Now what are you going to say to them? We are of the belief, of course, in the Shi'i school. And Alam al-Amini mentions all of the Sunni narrations as well, which say that Surah 5 verse 67 was revealed, Ya ayyuhar rasul, ballag ma unzla ilayka min rabbik. Wa an lam taf'al fa ma ballagta rasa'lata. Wallah ya'asamuka min al-nas. O Messenger of Allah, preach what has been bestowed upon you from your Lord. If you do not do it, your message is incomplete, Ya Allah. 23 years. Hold on. Salah had already been discussed. Aqimu salah wa atu zakah. Zakah has been discussed. Khums has been discussed. Wa'alamu anna ma ghanimtum min shay'in. Fa anna lillah khumusah. In chapter 8 verse 41. Amur bil ma'roof has been discussed. Hajj has just been shown to the people. Amur bil ma'roof has been discussed. With Luqman's story for example. Yeah? Ya Bunay, aqim as-salat, wa'mur bil ma'roof. Nahi an al-munkar has been discussed. Enjoying the good and forbid the evil. That's been discussed. Jihad has been discussed. You find, for example, all of these have been discussed. What's left? Fasting has been discussed. We know Shah Ramadan, alladhi unzilla fi hill. Quran. That's all been discussed. What is left? That in Surah Al Ma'idah, Surah 5, verse 67, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Holy Prophet, Preach what's been bestowed upon you. If you don't, your message is incomplete. Ya Rasul, wait. Everything's been discussed. What is left that God also tells him? If you don't do it, your message is incomplete. Hold on, but I explained to everyone Tawheed. I explained to everyone my Nubuwa. I explained to everyone Qiyamah. I explained to everyone Salah, Psalm, Hajj, Zakah. I've explained everything. To what's left that I have to announce? Otherwise, the whole religion is incomplete. Which shows Imamah is not post Muhammad. Imamah is part of Islam. Some try to say Imamah is a political position, Khilafah is a political position. We believe as much as Tawheed and Nubuwa and Qiyamah is part of the pillars of this religion, Imamah is part of the pillar of this religion. Because it is discussed before the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. So the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, gathers everybody. And as I said, no Muslim denies this incident took place. They may deny the interpretation of the sermon, but no one can deny that in a hot afternoon, 18th of the Hijjah, 10th year after Hijrah, just after Hajj, when everyone thinks that's the final sermon, he stops at Khum and no one can deny that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, asks everybody to gather the saddles and then begins this sermon, not a five minute sermon mind you, it's a couple hour sermon. 100,000 people. And he wants everybody to pass the message to everybody so everybody can hear. He says, My Lord is your master. My Lord is my master. Then he asks them a question. Don't I have a greater authority on you than you have over yourselves? They said to him, yes. مَوْلَى فَهَذَا عَلِيٌّ مَوْلَى 
whoever I have a greater authority. Now this Ali has a greater authority. Allahumma wali man wala, wa adi man ada, wansur man nasara, waghdul man khadala. Oh Allah, be a guardian to whoever takes Ali ibn Abi Talib as his guardian. And be an enemy to whoever takes Ali as an enemy. And be a helper to whoever helps the cause of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And finish off whoever tries to finish the teachings and guidance of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib And then at the end he says, and withdraw your mercy from those who show hate to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Tell me, if Imam Ali and Khalid and Walid supposedly had a skirmish or a problem over the spoils of Yemen, which beggars the question, how do I trust these companions if they're having fights around me? How do I trust them with leadership after I die when half of them don't like each other? But that's for another day. They showed their true colors at Jamal and Safin. If that was the case, would I raise this man's hand in front of 100,000 people just to make this announcement and then say, okay, everyone go home. I am making clear to my community an announcement that when I pass away, this is the man who will be your spiritual guide in the same way you took me as Ola, now he's Ola. Therefore, when this takes place, Hassan bin Thabit comes. He recites his famous poetry and you have the companions one after the other coming to congratulate Imam Ali salam. So this is known as the incident of Ghadir. And it was to make clear that don't come later on and say I never left behind for you a guide. And if there's no someone missing from here, tell them what took place. It's normal. Sometimes you're not at a battle, you go home, you tell the rest of the community this is what took place. This happened, this happened. It's normal. So that is known as what took place, the gist of the sermon and the announcement that was made. So you mentioned the word Mola there. You know, I've, I've had discussions at uni, for example, where people come at me and say, Mola could mean friend or brother, or I read even on a website today, someone had termed it as love. Mm. I don't know how. What would you respond to people regarding the word Mola and its true meaning? Arabic, there is a concept known as what's the Qarina, what's the context? Like English. If I say that Alexander was the lion of the seas, doesn't mean literally he's an animal in the sea known as a lion. It means he was someone brave in the seas. I have to see, is the usage metaphorical? Is the usage literal? What's the context of the usage? Before he said, Man kuntu Mawla, the Qarina was Surah 33 verse 6. Therefore the word Mawla, you're right, it has 20 odd meanings. Could be friend, could be love, could be slave, could be so many master, so many meanings. But the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, is the king of the clearest guidance and the most simple guidance. And so the Holy Prophet, before he says, Men Kuntumas, says, he quotes Surah 33 verse 6. The Prophet has a greater right or authority than the believers have over themselves. You know what that means? That means when some companions were trying to make excuses that they're not going to go to the battlefield, they want to ask their parents first if they should go to the battlefield or not. The Quran revealed the verse. Your parents are nothing when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, asks you something. Be Abi Anta, Wa Ummi, Wa Nafsi, and so on and so forth. So when it comes to the word Mola, I see many people say, Mola just meant that he put his hand up in front of 100,000 people to say that he's my friend. <laughs> no. He uses a word which Allah has used for him. He now uses it for Ali. This is very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had used the word awla for the Holy Prophet. And Nabi awla bil mu'minina. They accept, yes. So the word mawla's context is the word awla. 
And everybody knew the word Awla as being the one who is first and has the right of authority over all of you. So why didn't the Prophet just use the word Imam and just settle it once and for all rather than having to use Mawla? Anyone who asks that question, why doesn't the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, use the word Imam? It's someone who has not seen the way Allah describes his Prophet in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when talking about authority in the Quran uses different words. Sometimes the Prophet is known as Rasul, do you agree? Yes. Sometimes the Prophet is known as Nabi, do you agree? Yes. Sometimes the Prophet is known as Khalil, as Ibrahim. Sometimes the Prophet's authority is known as Wali. Does not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe his Prophet in the Quran? With the authoritative word wali in chapter 5, verse 55, in Nama wali yukum. Why don't you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why you use the word wali yukum? In Nama wali yukum Allah wa Rasulullah. You know the famous ayah that your wali is Allah and his messenger. Why put the word wali there? Why don't you, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just say, and uh, the Allah, the Messenger, are those who are your authorities. Why the stress on ensuring the word waliyukum? Why when you're talking about the Prophet having authority, why wasn't the word Nabi enough? Why did you have to say, and Nabi you awla? It's as if there's a double stress on that authority. Yes. That we know he is a Rasul. He's your Wali as well. We know he's a Nabi, but he's Awla as well. And Nabi you Awla bil Mu'minina min anfusihim. So therefore, here when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi uses man kuntu mawla, he's saying to all of them, all of you accepted me as your Wali. You accepted me all as Awla. You heard in Nama Wali Yukum, you heard an Nabi Yu Awla. Okay, well, if all of you know these terms are referring to my authority in chapter 5, verse 55, and chapter 33, verse number 6, Man kuntu Mawla, Father Ali Mawla. Allahumma Wali Man Wala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be a guardian for whoever takes Ali as his guardian. Therefore, when the Muslims are hearing these terms, if Rasulullah had mentioned Imam, people want the word Imam to be mentioned. Where in the Quran does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, continuously refer to his Prophet as an Imam for the people? Prophet Ibrahim. Nabi Ibrahim, how about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Rasulullah, you find his authority mentioned Nabi, Rasul, Wali, Awla. Therefore, Rasulullah is using the same authoritative terms in describing Ali's position now. That in the same way you people recognize me as your wali, in Nama waliyukum Allah, wa Rasul, and his Prophet, in the same way you read the ayah in the Quran, and Nabi you awla bil min anfusihim. Likewise, here, man kuntu mawla. Whoever I am the master of, whoever I am the first in authority over, whoever I am a guardian over, Father Ali Mawla. So Rasulullah is using what Allah has used with the terms of authority. To back up his point with yep. the context yep. from the Qur'an. Going on the topic of the Qur'an, you mentioned chapter 5 verse 67, uh, which was regarding convey the message onto people, otherwise your message isn't finished. That comes after chapter 5 verse 3, which is we've completed religion for you. Why, is, why does that come after that verse? I, I, I never knew the Qur'an was a book that was in order. I'm surprised that you're asking me about the order of the Qur'an. The Qur'an is a book whose first chapter, Al-Fatiha, is arguably the fifth chapter to be revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon his family. You're giving me a question which seems like one who has come from a biblical reading, where you begin with the whole creation of man as a biblical narrative. The Qur'an is not a book of historical narrative. Surah Al-Baqarah is the second surah of the Qur'an. Do you agree? Yes. Third surah is which one? Al Imran. Both of these are revealed in Medina. They weren't in Mecca. If the Quran was about order of revelation, 
The first surah should be which one? Iqra, alaq. Second surah, qalam. Third surah, you got muzammil, mudathir, al-fatiha. These are all the early surahs. If you're looking at order of the life of prophets, I'd say barring the story of Yusuf, every prophet's story is jumping from one place to another. If you're looking at the order of revelation of laws, you can't tell from the Quran about order of revelation of laws. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his wisdom has placed certain verses at certain places. We go to the Sabah and Nuzul to see when the revelation was. One thing we do know is that the last verses of the Holy Quran were in Surah Al-Ma'idah and a couple of Surah Al-Baqarah. Inshallah. Uh, we're going to take a short break, Sayyidina. Uh, to our respected viewers at home, uh, don't forget you can ring in uh, on the number which is 0203 515 uh, We're going to take a short break and inshallah after the break we'll be back discussing more on the topic of Eid al-Qadir and also looking through your questions uh, via WhatsApp, Facebook or you can ring in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear respected brothers, sisters and viewers, welcome back to part two of Live in London with our esteemed guest, Dr. Said Amman Nakshwani. Tonight's topic is the topic of Eid al-Qadir, uh, Eid Mubarak to those who have joined in since the break. Uh, if you'd like to put your questions to Sayyid, uh, please call in on 0203 515 -0199. That's 0203 5150199 and inshallah we'll do the best we can to put you in touch with Dr. Sayyid Ammar. Assalamu alaykum. Wa alaykum back salam after the break. Sayyidina, in the first half we talked about the event of Qadir. This is an event that happened, I don't know, roughly 1400 years ago. Why is it important to care if it was Ali's hand that was raised or if it was someone else's? It happened so long ago, some people say, who cares? What would you reply to that? I'd say, I'd say tragedies occurred in Islamic history because of those who did not take the guidance of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family from his Lord that day. Um, there is no doubt the repercussions are many. And the sermon in Nahj al-Balagha known as Shaq Shaqiyya, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, makes it clear the innovations that occurred because of those who did not take the guidance of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. I don't deny that there are Muslims out there in the world who are sincere, who are thankful, who are people of humility. But there's a difference drinking from tap water and drinking from the springs of Evian. I don't mind if you drink from tap water, you're more than welcome. But there's nothing like that which has come from the purest spring. And that there are Muslims out there who have drunk from the tap water and have got to the love of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. But it's not like when you've tasted from the supplications of, and the knowledge of and the wonderful mind of Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Ahlul Bayt. We have a caller on the line, Sayyidina. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. How are you, brother? Eid Mubarak Alhamdulillah. and your family, inshallah. I would like to firstly uh, express my heartiest uh, congratulations to you and all the Mominin on this auspicious uh, occasion. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shabir Agha. I'm calling from New Jersey. And uh, my uh, question is, is Aqidah more important than Amal? Does belief supersede action? Thank you very much, brother. Thank you. My beloved friend, Sayyid Shabir Agha, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and bless his family. Well, I would hope that our aqidah would lead to our good deeds. A person who claims to be a follower of Imam Ali alayhi salam is someone who would try their hardest to live the life of Imam Ali alayhi salam. You find that the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam constantly make it clear that we have a responsibility 
those of us who have taken on the wilaya of Imam Ali alayhi salam have a major responsibility to provide and give the best image of the teachings of Imam Ali alayhi salam. As Imam al sadiq and others mention, كُونُ لَنَا زَيْنًا وَلَا تَكُونُ عَلَيْنَا شَيْنًا حَبِّبُونَ إِلَى النَّاسِ وَلَا تُبَغِّضُونَ إِلَيْهِمْ That we should be a source of adornment in our actions for the family of the Prophet, peace be upon them. Is it enough for a person to say that I love Imam, I love Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, but not follow the teachings of Imam Ali السلام. And the Quran always brings one's faith alongside one's good deeds. How many times you read Wal Asr, Inna al insana lafi khosr, illa alladheena amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil haq wa tawasaw bil sah. Therefore, if I have held on and claim to have Iman, next to Iman should always be Amal Salih. Shouldn't just be a case of, you know what, I love Imam Ali, love Imam Ali, but I'm not the ones who make any effort to try and wake up in the morning, to remember the man who died in the morning. You know, Fajr prayers is never easy for any of us to wake up. I'm groggy half the time when I'm waking up for Fajr. Um, but at the same time, you think to yourself, well, you know what, there really is freedom in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't have to do it out of fear of hell or because I want heaven, but to be thankful to my Lord in the morning. Now that's a true sign of a person whose aqeedah is a alawi shi'i aqeedah, that he follows the teachings of the man as well as follows him in action as well. Inshallah. So they really should go hand in hand. Inshallah. Speaking of the man Imam Ali alayhi salam, you mentioned Ghadir was the event where the Prophet raised his hand and declared him as the Imam or the leader of the people. Was that the first time this had happened or had it happened previously throughout the 21, 23 oh, years? There's a number of positions Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib has before Ghadir where he's on a different class to any of the other riffraff that surrounds him. You have a lot of Bedouins around him. You have a lot of ex-thugs, ex-murderers. And yes, they join the religion of Islam. But it's not the same as someone who's brought up in the prestige and the class and the dignity of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And from the very young age you find in Surah 26 verse 214 of the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa anthir ashiratakal al-aqrabin Warn your nearest relatives that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, is known in the famous incident of Da'wat al-Ashira when he invites his nearest relatives to tell them the open propagation of the religion, his prophethood, that his position given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he makes it clear that whoever accepts me will be my successor after me. Every other successor in the history of the religion of Islam was not there that day. And in some cases, hadn't even become Muslim. And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, at that time was how old? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, on that day was in his teens. And yet subhanallah you find that he stands up, I accept, I accept. And then the Prophet says that you are my brother and my successor and my vicegerent after me. That was at a very young age. Then you find for example that there are certain merits given to Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, that no one else shares. No one else has ever been described with the line, Ali is to me like Aaron was to Moses, except that there is no prophet after me. No one has been described as the nafs of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the self of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. And I'm not surprised when I see Sufi chains which take Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib as the highest in their tariqah when it comes to the spiritual axis of this religion. He is known as the nafs of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That's the highest position you can be in in the religion of Islam. You've got to be a very low human being to not appreciate when you have a jewel like Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. I do often wonder if Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, had belonged to another religion, would he have been treated as barbarically as we treated him? Not only was there an insult of making him fourth, but then the 
injury to add to the insult and the insult added to the injuries was that they started to fight him in wars like Jamal and Safin, having seen everything he had given to the religion of Islam. So he's called Nafs. He is known in Hadith al Manzila, Ali is to me like Aaron is to Moses. The Prophet did not say by anyone, He is to me like this Prophet was to this Prophet. And he has the ultimate honor of the incident of the cloak and the grace poured upon him and Hassan and Hussein and Fatima in the famous verse of Tathir narrated in Muslim and Tirmidhi where Umm Salama and Aisha, the wives of the Prophet peace be upon his family mention how Ali, Fatima, Hassan and Hussein were under the cloak with the Holy Prophet peace be upon his family and the eye was revealed in Nama Yuridullah Liyudhiba and so on. So all of these highlight either a clear announcement of successorship from a young age infallibility, spiritual heights which no one can reach and being to the Prophet Muhammad like Aaron was to Moses. And there are so many more merits that we could give that it's unbelievable how anyone could take anyone but Ali as successor of the Holy Prophet peace be upon his family. I think one of the lines in the sermon actually that was coming across today was that the Holy Prophet ﷺ in his speech said, there are numerous virtues of Ali that I, if I was to speak to you about them now, I don't have enough time to explain them all to you. Uh, we have another caller on the line, Sayyidina. Assalamu alaikum. Eid Mubarak uh, to you. Eid Mubarak, brother. my brothers. What's your you. uh, name and where are you calling from, please? Um, my name is Jabber. I am from Kingdom of Bahrain, but I'm currently studying in the U.S. MashaAllah. What's your question, um, please? Um, first of all, Sayyid Ammar, I have the highest amount of respect and gratitude towards you and your lectures. Uh, and the fact that you have this level of intellect at a young age is very admirable. Um, I believe you're a mo role model for uh, our youth. Thank you, Jabber. Um, Thank you. My question um, has to do with Ayat Wilaya. Um, and the question is, why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just mention Imam Ali's name السلام, in that verse and that might have avoided division and bloodshed among uh, Muslims? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jabir, and thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate words from uh, our youth and all those who have the love of Ahlul Bayt. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen them all. It's an interesting question. Now why does Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, why isn't his name just mentioned in that ayah and that will stop all division? Reality is Jabir on the first level. Those who look for the truth will find it. I remember looking at the ayah in the Quran chapter 9 verse number 40. You find that this ayah is about the cave. The two who were in the cave. I ask Jabir one question. If you were to ask millions in the world today, who's the second in the cave? Uh, you'll find them straight away saying Abu Bakr. If you ask them, his name's not in the ayah. Could Allah not have made it clear? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Thani ithnain? Yes. The Quran has a teacher. That teacher tells us who an ayah is revealed about. The books are there. And if a person is going to be unbiased, he'll look at books from both sides. Yes. Now when you're looking at that ayah, chapter 9, verse number 40, you say, Thani ithnain. Could not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mentioned other names of people, the munafiqun? Ya Allah, why don't you just mention who they are? The hypocrites in the Quran. Why doesn't God just say one, two, three, four, five, six other hypocrites? Or this hundred are the hypocrites. Or these twenty are the hypocrites. Why don't you just mention them? Ya Allah, why don't you mention, for example, other companions who did good deeds? That sometimes there's an ayah in the Holy Quran. And the only companion who got a mention was Zayd. No other companion. Every other companion was not mentioned. Therefore, when you come to this ayah, my dear brother Jabir, on the first level, there are many narrations about Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib being the one who gave away his ring and in Sunni and Shia literature 
Secondly, even if Ali ibn Abi Talib's name, Wallah, if it was mentioned throughout the Quran, the hatred of Badr and Hunayn in the hearts of those who saw what he did as a youth would still have meant that they would have tried to burn that same Quran. Muawiyah did not put the Quran on the spear. That's without Ali's name. Muawiyah, when he fought Ali at Safin, he put the Quran on the spear. There was a few Qurans that were put on the spears. That's without Imam Ali's name inside it. What would have happened had Imam Ali put his name inside it? Likewise, not every specific detail is put in the Quran. It's a salah. My Lord, I ask you a question, Ya Allah. Salah, you tell me, is one of the pillars of my religion. Why did you not tell me Salat al-Maghrib is three? Where did I find Salat al-Maghrib is three? I found it in Hadith. Salat al-Isha is how many rak'ah? Four. Where is it in the Quran? Could not Allah? What's clear from that ayah is, wilaya is being translated from Allah to the Prophet, to those who believe. Now we can't all be awliya Allah. We're not all authority on each other. There has to be a specific one who the ayah is referring to. Someone who's given away zakat while in a state of ruku'ah. There's not going to be a million people in the mosque of the Prophet that day saying, hey, anyone want um, zakat while I'm in ruku'ah? It's specifically in honor of someone. If someone tells me, Alladina Amin was a plural, that means the whole Muslim community. So Allah is saying, I'm your wali, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, is your wali, and all of you are the wali of all of you. <laughs> nah, come on. And I hope all of these answers, and there's many more that would suffice. Inshallah. It's quite weird saying, his name's Jabir, my name's Jabir. <laughs> it's an <laughs> Sometimes honor. Sometimes I think if you're putting the question to me, or you meant It's an honor that we have many <laughs> Jabirs. It's <laughs> an honor. May Allah bless the soul of Jabir and Abdullah and Ansar. Uh, we have another caller yeah, on ahead. the line as well. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, brother. How are you? Alhamdulillah. How are you, brother? Eid Mubarak to you and your Good. respected Eid family. Eid Mubarak. Thank you very much. Eid Mubarak. Eid Mubarak to you uh, and Sayyid what? as well. My name is Sayyid Riyad Hadabadi. I'm calling from New Jersey. Sayyid Riyad, uh, may Allah bless you. Inshallah, inshallah. May Allah bless you too, Sayyid. I have a question. What is the difference between being a muhib, a lover of Imam Ali, and a Shia of Imam Ali? What is the criteria differentiating the two? Mashallah, very good question. Ahsan Sayyid Riyadh, may Allah bless you and bless Mawlana Abidi and the other brothers in America. Uh, muhib of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam can be many. There are muhibbeen of Ali who believe in him as the fourth Khalifa. But they love even those who fought him. They'll make excuses for the enemy and they'll make excuses for him. Shia of Ali alayhi salam is a prestigious position and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us one day that position at the moment we're trying to be the true Shia are the likes of Salman and Abu Dhar the likes of Maytham and Kumail the likes of Hujr bin Adi and Amr bin Hamak al Khuzai. their prayers their fasts they were people constantly with a relationship with the Holy Quran your Habib bin Madahars and Muslim bin Awsajas People who had memorized verse after verse of the Quran in the nights, they were in supplications, but they were also people of charity. They were people of forgiveness. They never closed the door of forgiveness. People who constantly sought to help God's creation, knowing that that was a service to the Creator. And that's why you find Imam al Askari salam, talks of different merits of the Shia. Imam al Baqir talks of the different merits of the Shia. Imam Amir al muminin in the khutbah of the Muttaqeen talks of the different merits of what a Muttaqi is and a true Shia is. You find that, for example, they'll mention there are those who begin every act with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. There are those who'll perform Ziyarat al-Arba'een. There are those who, for example, will recite 51 units of Salah a day. Me and you, I can just about get to 17. With Salat al-Layl, you add 11. With the Nawafil, it'll get to 51. I don't know how many of us have even come near that. So a muhib, a lover of Ali السلام, is someone who appreciates Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, but if for example Aisha fights Imam Ali then he'll say listen I love Aisha and I love Ali I will love Muawiyah and I love Ali or I may, won't make a judgment on Muawiyah if he fights Ali yeah? or they'll for example come and say that we love Ali but you people have exaggerated his position 
But the person who has found the true love of Ali is someone who follows Imam Ibn Muhammad a true Shia follows him in all his actions in every way possible and dissociates from his enemies. Inshallah. Going back to the topic of Eid al-Qadir, why didn't the Prophet make that announcement at Hajj? Why did he do it at Qadir? Was it to do with the Yemenites coming in or was it to do with Iraq? What's the purpose of picking Khum like you said to... Iraq, I don't think there were, were there any Iraqi Muslims at the time? I don't think there were, I don't think there were Iraqi Muslims as such at the time. Maybe six years later, Kufa is established as a, a you know, instead of being a garrison town, a place where people are able to actually uh, uh, live. And that's established by Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, that's 17th year after Hijrah. So I remember someone saying, well, if he stops at Ghadir, how about the people of Kufa? They won't hear the message. I don't think there were any Muslims from uh, there at the time. Yemen, Yemen had just, just, just accepted the ridge of Islam because of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Uh, Khalid ibn Walid had not done the best job there and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, they've just accepted. So to look at Iraq and Yemen as geographically not the people who necessarily are going to hear about it. I, think, I don't know about Iraq, but you know, Yemen have just come into Islam. Um, and why does he stop at Ghadir Khum? Well, why does he make an announcement at Da'wat al-Ashira? Why does he go to Ta'if? Why does he go to Medina on the night of Hijrah? You can ask his Lord. His Lord is the one who guides him. Yes. His, God, his Lord is the one who teaches him. And so when his Lord tells him this is the best place, this is the place everyone's leaving, and even those who've gone ahead, call them back. And even those who haven't come, you find a way for them to come. You know, sometimes people say, well, if you had done it, Hajj, everyone's together. Well, at the end of the day, even if everyone's not together, we'll call them all back. What's the problem? People are yearning to have a, a drop of water from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. Um, and sometimes in life, there are certain people you need them to hear the message. We've had a question come in from a uh, brother who's asking, uh, did Imam Ali move the Islamic capital from Medina to Kufa? If so, why? Well, he moves the, the capital from Medina to Kufa because of a number of reasons. He has you know, loyal supporters in Kufa who have been you know, vociferously outspoken for a few years uh, while they lived in Kufa, especially those who were originally from Yemen, who some later on become part of what are known as the Shortat al-Khamis or the, poli the Thursday police. <laughs> And then you have, um, of course, Muawiyah as a major threat. You know, Muawiyah is in charge of Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan. Kufa strategically would be somewhere a bit better. And the, it seems the ground is somewhere which is a bit easier for him than the many enemies who now were surrounding Mecca and Medina. Mecca and Medina. We have another caller on the line, Said. Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Mubarak. Sayyidna, how are you doing, Sayyid Jabba? Sayyid Jabba. Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah, Habibi. Eid Mubarak to you and your respected family, inshallah. Eid, Eid, may this Eid be a blessed day, inshallah, for all the Shi'is and all the Muhabban of Ahlabay, alayhim assalam. And truly, this day is a blessed day in the history of all of mankind and in general. Inshallah. Thank you. Yes, brother, what's your uh, question for... Um, in our hadith, we have two days of uh, Zadiyah mentioned. And uh, uh, the ninth of Rabi al-Awwal being the, uh, the other day, of course. What is the, significant, uh, what is the significance of having two Eid, both known as Eid al one being known as Eid al al-Awwal, which is the one we're currently in, and then the other one in Arabic known as Eid al-Sadi al-Thani, the second Eid al and what is the significance of having two Aids, both named after Qadir? Okay, inshallah. inshallah. Thank you. Well, you got Aid al Ghadir on the 18th of the Hijjah, uh, is remembering and is honoring the Wilay of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And on the 9th of Rabi' al Awwal, we are honored to be remembering the Imam of the final Imam of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt, Imam al-Hujjah Ajal Allah Faraj al-Sharif. So back to the topic of Ghadir again. The Prophet lifts up Imam Ali's hands, declares him as the leader. You, as you rightly mentioned, the so-called Khalifs come one by one and shake his hand, congratulate him. I guess everyone then goes home or continues on their journey. How then does Abu Bakr become 
Khalif, if he's literally just walked up to Imam Ali alayhi salam and congratulated him on becoming the successor of the Prophet, how does that, how does one comprehend? <laughs> well, uh, I'd say, you know, if you're looking at Abu Bakr and Omar's uh, behavior in the last days of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, his life, it's very interesting. Uh, to say the least, they don't join Osama, the 18-year-old's army. And um, they say that why should we be un in, under the command of someone who's younger than us? And then in the incident of the pen and paper, when the Prophet asked for a pen and paper to write that, for which his Ummah will not go astray, Omar is known to have clearly said that you are delirious, the Qur'an is enough for us. To which Ibn Abbas later on comments, Thursday, what a Thursday, and talks about how emotional it was the behavior and how the Prophet actually asked the companions to leave. Omar then makes an interesting statement when the Prophet dies that anyone who claims Muhammad is dead, I'll kill him. <laughs> uh, he's returned back to his Lord like Moses. Uh, he's gone and will return like Moses. So, I don't know. It's, it's, it all paves the way for an election that takes place. Arguably the messiest election uh, mankind has ever witnessed. Of course, you can't say this because people then call you sectarian. I don't, I don't want to be sectarian. The problem is, as a Shia, any time you discuss history, eventually you're going to get called sectarian because you're dealing with other schools where you know, discussing history and being proud of history is sometimes a rarity. But um, it's a wishy-washy election. There's a skirmish between the Ansars and Abu Bakr, Omar, and those who are claiming the Muhajir should rule. A lot of the companions are absent, so I don't know how that's an election. So yeah, it's eventually become caliph after that election. So going on the pen and paper point as an example, um, you know, we mentioned, for example, within university debates, within debates, for example, at Speaker's Corner, on these YouTube videos these days, a lot of people say if a successor was chosen by the Prophet, why then would he want a pen and paper to write something down? If it's already made clear, what's the pen and paper for? What uh, would you... it's, a, it's a very simple answer. In Islamic law, there is um, a will where you talk about all your material belongings and where they are to be uh, given and who's going to execute that will and who's going to inherit what you have. And that was all in the hands of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, to execute the will of the Holy Prophet peace be upon him and his family. Pen and paper incident is regarding what? It's regarding a piece of advice for the community. It's not obligatory. You become a father. In your last days, you can tell your community that I, or you can tell your sons, I'll give me a pen and paper. I'll write for you that where you will not go astray. I want to give you advice. Yeah. Interesting that Qastalani in his Sharh of Bukhari believes that the names of the successors of the Prophet was to be written. That's his interpretation of why he wants a pen and paper. But for me, that's not my concern. If the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, wants to give you advice and you want to call him delirious, you can meet your Lord on the Day of Judgment and explain why you thought the greatest man to have ever walked on the face of this earth uh, was delirious at that moment. Um, but when Omar says the Quran is enough for us, he gives us an indication of what he thinks may have been written. Does Imam Ali at any point attest his appointment, either on the day of Qadir or afterwards? Of course, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, a number of occasions we have, and Alam al Amini in Al Ghadir has referenced all of them, where he mentions, be it at the beginning of battle, such as the Battle of Jamal, mentioning and reminding the people of the day of Ghadir, um, and on other occasions where he meets certain companions who are still alive and reminds them, were you not there on the day of Ghadir? How could you remain silent now? And you find the narrations are all present in our literature. And what about when it comes to the other Imams or the other Ahlul Bayt salam, regarding the event of Ghadir? Have they passed down certain, I don't know, obligatory actions or recommended actions we could partake on such a day? Well, Imam al-Sadiq when he'd go past a certain area, people would say to him that we see there's an emotion on you in this area and says, this is the land of Ghadir, this is the area where my grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib was announced as the guardian of the believers after the death of the Holy Prophet peace be upon his family. He also mentions that it's the greatest Eid in the religion of Islam, which no doubt it is. Um, I find no more joy in my life than 
uh, honoring the celebration of, um, of Eid al-Ghadir. And we are told of uh, recommendations, people being in supplications, fasting on such days, uh, performing ghusl on such days, repenting back to God on such days. Uh, no doubt there are recommendations from the Ahlul Bayt about such a day. I guess we've now gone through that Imam Ali's become a successor or a leader after the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his progeny. How do we view Imam Ali alayhi salam within Shi'i thought? Do we view him as a Arab sort of leader or personage or a mystical guide? What's our understanding of such an individual? Ali ibn Abi Talib is the second greatest creation of God. The greatest creation of God in Shia thought is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. And the second is Ali, son of Abu Talib alayhi salam. There are certain lineages God chose to guide man to actualizing their potential, to achieving the highest levels of dignity and humility and honor, and to be known for their forbearance and for their wisdom. God chose the family of Imran, God chose the family of Abraham, and God chose the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. For us, we don't revere Ali and Hassan and Hussein because they're the children or grandchildren of the Prophet, peace be upon his family. In the same way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran said, Inna Allah astafa Adama wa Nuhan wa Ali Ibrahim wa Ali Imran ala al-alameen dhurriyatan ba'dhuha min ba'dh. In the same way, God said, I chose Adam, Noah, the family of Abraham, the family of Imran. Likewise, God chose the family of Muhammad, peace be upon his family, as the family of wisdom. The Prophet Muhammad himself says, you want to look at the knowledge of Adam, the patience of Noah, the forbearance of Abraham, the wisdom of Moses. Look at the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. Therefore to us, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam is the gate to the city of the knowledge of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. I personally do not lose any sleep if you don't take Ali ibn Abi Talib as your Imam. I really don't. And I tell you what, Ali ibn Abi Talib does not lose anything if you don't take him as your Imam. It's your loss. It's your loss. You can debate me all day and say to me, Mawla means this, Mawla means that. I know very well that when I looked at everybody surrounding the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, there's one person who's on a different class. But my dear brother Sayyid Jabir, some people can't appreciate class. You can't do anything about it. Some people are not meant to appreciate some people will never appreciate class. There are some people, if they see a Ferrari, they can appreciate. There are others they just can't appreciate. They'll appreciate riffraff, Bedouin thugs. They'll appreciate this guy used to slap his sister, and the other used to bury girls alive. They'll take from a person who's met the Prophet a couple years, suddenly narrates God knows how many. That's their level of appreciation. Some people cannot appreciate class because they don't have that class. So even if you tell him all day, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, some people just don't know class when they see it. When it comes to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, السلام, therefore, for us, the very manifestation of God's names on earth can be seen in the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and the fountainhead of all of them who every Sunni, every Shia, every Sufi, every Salaf, every, every has to love in the year 2017 is Ali ibn Abi Talib There are other companions people don't like. Ali ibn Abi Talib is loved by all. And it goes to show you his prowess that how much history tried to delete his name. How much history was envious of his lovers. He remains so high. What does the poet say? says, if it wasn't for your prostration, I would have said you created the heavens and the earth. And if it wasn't for your prostration, <coughs> I would have said Noah's ark was in your hands. And if it wasn't for your prostration, I would have said you're the one who put the spirit into Christ. And if it wasn't for your prostration, I would have said that you taught Gabriel they may have raced you and won the race for caliphate 
But I'll tell you what, in Badr, Uhud, and Hunayn, they were far from winning that race. So you find Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, السلام, no doubt the levels that he achieves in his life is not the levels of Arab riffraff and chavs. And you're talking the highest class which Christians and Hindus and Sikhs and people around the world until today look at his personality and character and knowledge and literature and wisdom. And I feel sorry for the one who has not drunk from the spring of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Inshallah, we can always learn to keep his message alive. We have another caller on the line, Sayyidina. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, and to you too, brother. Uh, could you please share your name and your question with us, inshallah. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Sayyid Cameron Ali. And uh, <coughs> I've got a question, maybe a little out of context, but uh, it keeps bothering me and um, I keep thinking about it. That uh, the the Islamic text, for example, uh, like Nahj al was written 700 years after the martyrdom of Hazrat Ali. And it is such a nice, nice piece of literature, uh, you know, every single word, um, you, you just believe that it cannot be said by any other personality but Hazrat Ali. Uh, how it became possible after so many hundred years to kind of collate and collect um, every single word has really said in his life and you know make it a book like Najib Blaga. Obviously there's no doubt about uh, the, 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 the context and uh, the things which were said but uh, how it was possible and how truthful is that basically. Thank you brother. Thank you very much. Nahj al was not written 700 years after the martyrdom of Imam Ali. It's written a few hundred years after the martyrdom of Imam Ali. So anyone who thinks that this is some, you know, some text that's written, for example, in the 8th century or something, no. Within a few hundred years of the martyrdom of Imam Ali, السلام, the great Sharif al-Radhi, had compiled the sermons of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, السلام, especially for their wonderful Arabic. Nahj al is translated as the peak of eloquence. And so you find that there were earlier texts where these sermons had been. So he had access to earlier works, collects them from the earlier works and compiles the Nahj. But certainly not 700 years. Within, I would say, 100 years of the find of the occultation of the 12th Imam, you've got the beginning and the gathering of Nahj al-Balagha, Sharif al radhi and his great Brother Sharif al Murtada, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless their souls, were great scholars, and Sharif al Radhi compiles the Naj. Inshallah. We have a few minutes left before the end of the show, Sayyidina. Just uh, back to the last point you made where you read that wonderful poem. To a non Shi'i or someone else from another different school of thought, they might come to those words and think of them as shirk or extreme or qalat. What would your response be to that? Let them. Inshallah. I'm not going to lose any sleep. I see people out there debating, you know, if you don't want Ali as your first Imam and you prefer to him as the fourth Caliph and you prefer to go to sleep in the night wondering on the day of Jamal whose side you would have been on and make excuses for everyone, and then do it. If you can't appreciate Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, I'm not going to lose any sleep over that. It's not hard to appreciate Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's wisdom, knowledge, foresight, vision. There are proverbs and quotes of wisdom from Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, that people who have never heard of Islam fall in love with. I myself, when people ask me about, for example, some of the tattoos, they say, what tattoo you have? I mention a quote of Imam Ali, for example, brothers in faith equals in humanity. Wow, who said that? You mention, for example, when he talks about his love of God to Kumail, what sprinkles in you overflows in me. You've got other quotes of Imam Ali, other pieces of poetry, the supplications of Imam Ali السلام, alone. I defy anyone, if you get me a hundred thousand Sahaba on the Day of Judgment, all I want is Ali. I'm confident if I have Imam Ali, I don't want no other companion. I don't want nobody. I'll go with Imam Ali ibn Talib -Islam. on the Day of Judgment. You can have a hundred thousand companions. If one of those companions has a supplication like Kumail, 
or a munajat like his munajat, his whispered prayers, or the Sha'baniya, or others. Anything you want, I'll give you. And like Kumail said to Hajjaj bin Yusuf, uh, to Hajjaj bin Yusuf al-Thaqafi before he killed him, when Hajjaj said, leave Abu Turab and I'll let you go. And he said, show me a way better than Abu Turab's. So if someone out there looks at me and says, you people are too extreme Shia, you love Ali too much. Yes, I do. I do. It's 2017. I do. <laughs> you, you believe in what I believe, you're more than welcome. And if you don't believe in what I believe, look, you, know, come on, you can follow your own way. I'm not going to lose any sleep. But I, sitting here, don't know 0.1% of Ali ibn Abi Talib And this is the love that I have for him. Imagine I had 1% of understanding of his knowledge and his sermons and his sayings and so on. There are poetry, piece of poetry of Ali in Arabic, the mind cannot come near. There are sermons, the whole sermon without alif. Tell me, who can give a whole lecture without using an Arabic word that does not have alif? Every Arabic word you think of, if you begin a lecture, Alhamdulillah, Alif. No. <laughs> Subhanallah, has to have Alif. A whole sermon without Alif. A whole sermon without a letter with a dot. Who could do that? Therefore, I feel sorry for you. Oh, you who sees Ali as one of a number of companions. I feel sorry for you who has not drunk from the wonderful spring of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Inshallah. God keeps the love of Ali in all of our hearts. Thank you. I wish we could keep talking about this topic, but our time has come to an end. I'd like to congratulate you again on Thank the you. auspicious event of Ghadir. And I'd like to congratulate you know, the Ummah out there on, the, of course, on this wonderful, uh, wonderful celebration. Inshallah, on Monday, we gather to celebrate an hour show on Eid al-Mubahala. That Inshallah. should be a wonderful discussion as Inshallah. well. Inshallah. Inshallah. And to our respected viewers uh, watching us from home, again, Eid Mubarak to you and your respected families. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Live in London with Dr. Said Ammar Nakshwani. Uh, inshallah, you will join us on Monday night where we'll be looking at the event of Mubahila. Please do keep us in your prayers and we look forward to joining you again soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.